On January 15th of 1926, the Miami Biltmore Hotel introduced Florida to a new tropical landscape with an endless variety of palms, a vibrant green lawn, and brightly colored shrubs and flowers. This foliage represented the beginning of a shift in the outdoor aesthetic of South Florida. The landscape was transforming from the pine and oak forested vistas of the pioneer era into an Edenesque pantropic paradise. These transformations were first enacted in the train of resorts as sites of domestication and leisure, but invented much earlier in the imagination of travel writers and naturalists of the 18th and 19th centuries. In the first three decades of the 20th century, the new tropical landscape was constructed by developers to create a tourist economy in Florida, offering American Northerners tropical travel within the United States. Plants were imported from locations throughout the tropics and combined to create a new singular tropical location, South Florida. The new landscape design was embedded with the colonial rhetoric of the domestication of an untamed tropical culture. These constructions informed the Florida we know today, in which the landscape is presented to visitors and inhabitants as an image of the state's tropical identity. The landscape passes as natural, neutral, normal, non-offensive, non-confrontational, and even native. The use of the landscape as a cultural medium goes unsuspected. Plants don't say anything, they just are. But in fact, they do say something. These plants in particular narrate a history of the colonization of the tropics through a spatial temporal simulation. The transition from pine to palm marked the death of the frontier fantasy in Florida and the birth of the fantasy of the state as a pantropic Eden. The fantasy of the pioneer was formed around the found landscape. The consistent backdrop of this phase was the pine. The pine operates as a sign of the projected identity of Florida as a wild and uninhabited frontier. The pine tree demonstrates a nature untouched by civilization. It's the pine tree that the settler chops down with the ax. It's the pine tree that's used to build the log cabin. And it's the pine tree that's used to build the fence that protects the pioneer's property. When clearing the land for the Biltmore Hotel and planned community of Coral Gables that surrounds it, landscape architect Frank Button and developer George Merrick retained small hammocks of the original pine, seen here in the distance and in the foreground on the right to preserve a portion of that fantasy. The pioneer era became a story of a primitive and pre-modern Florida, and only through the distance that narrative creates could the pine tree fit into the new identity that the region was developing. Prospective developers moving to the state at the turn of the century saw the palmetto palms that dotted the pine forests as a symbol of Florida's tropical potential and expanded its impact by adding variation to its palm populations. Palm trees became a state obsession. While only 15 palm species are known as native to the state, by the 1930s, over 100 species had been added. The palm tree had already been designated as an iconic symbol of the tropics by travel writers and naturalists of the 18th and 19th centuries. Observing innumerable varieties of palms in tropical travels, the palm became synonymous with the tropics. By increasing the diversity of palm species in Florida, 20th century developers recreated the mythos of the fruitful variation of the actual tropics. The new landscape was informed by misrepresentations of the torrid zone made by those 18th and 19th century tropical explorers. The travel writer and illustrator Henry Walter Bates, for instance, propagates tropical misinformation in his etching, Interior of Primeval Forest on the River Amazons, from his travel and natural history book, The Naturalist on the River Amazons, published in 1863. The people in the image are portrayed very small as to render the plants in the jungle massive. The humans are given the same amount of detail, if not less, than the foliage to establish that they are but a part of the jungle as they blend into the vegetation. Lithographic and etching processes like this were preferred over photographic representations in 19th centuries, but even after the technology was available, for their ability to manipulate the scene, incorporating plants that wouldn't have existed in those regions, and pushing elements together to create a compelling vista. The inhabitants depicted in these prints were as interchangeable as the foliage as physical traits of people from one geographic region were portrayed in completely different landscapes. Out of the anxiety produced in those tropical representations came the desire to domesticate and claim that landscape. This 1930s State Department of Agriculture produced advertisement depicting the lawn of a resort foregrounds the state's psychological export, a domesticated version of the tropics, first, and the state's most marketed agricultural commodity, oranges, second. To establish an image of the domestication of wild, Florida's wild landscape, the image depicts a perfect balance between unbridled wilderness and cultivated terrain. 
the forest perspective draws the focus to the information in the distance, an unkempt forest that surrounds the resort, framing the leisure space and bisecting it from the agricultural space of the orange grove. Seen next to the well-manicured lawn of the resort space, the forest wall is presented as a visually immersive presence of South Florida's untamed nature, but contained to the perimeter for the visitor to enjoy safely in the distance. For a tourist visiting a resort like the one depicted in this brochure, the forest wall would have been more of a representation of a fearful and wild wilderness than the actual presence of such. By the turn of the century, cultural perspectives on wilderness had undergone a shift. In previous eras, wilderness was perceived as wasteland, savage, the realm of Satan, where Moses was lost and Jesus was tested, or more generally, sites to be feared. In the new era, wilderness was sanctified, it was bestowed with grace and fragility, and understood as sites in need of protection from civilization. By the turn of the 20th century, fearful representations of nature were nostalgic. And while the forest wall surrounding the resort in the advertisement is actually a forest wall, preserved while the surrounding areas were cleared and developed, its purpose is for entertainment. But as a site of entertainment, the landscape is imbued with the ideology of the culture that constructed it. Each depiction of plant life within the resort reinforces the psychological and atmospheric conditions they were selling, the domesticated form of a dangerous tropical paradise. No Florida is a domesticated revision of Bates print. The mythologized landscape of Bates print is offered to its viewer as scientific research and a fact of the tropics. The No Florida brochure convinces its viewer of its factuality with its label. No Florida tells us Florida is a fact, the landscape is a fact, and this is insisted upon through its repetition. No Florida, no Florida. The name offers Florida to the visitor as a botanic exhibition of natural history that follows the footsteps of scientific research of the tropics from its Enlightenment period predecessors. And like its predecessors, the landscape is a myth. It's a cultural construction offered as a natural history display. Organizing the chaos of Bates' Amazonian jungle into an orderly scene, every position within the lawn of the resort offers a perfectly composed vista. Brightly colored flowers surround walking paths and perfectly symmetrical clusters. Each color rotates in its order, offering a hint of the construct of the exotic that is immediately tamed into the submission of a pattern. Monumental palm trees dominate the composition and dwarf the resort guests. Wandering in a contour along the drive, they offer just a hint of wild with their slightly unkempt shag of dried and dead frond. In a show of power over the barbarian palm, the wicker dining set that seats a group of visitors weaves the shaggy palm detritus into a perfectly structured grid. All are surrounded by the closely shaved sprawl of the Great Lawn that allows for panoptic views from any position within the resort grounds. Visitors can sip their juice in the shade and enjoy the power of their view. Where the Amazonian people of Bates Etching were relegated to the landscape as dehumanized elements that perpetuate the exotic stereotype of the jungle, the subjects of No Florida are featured prominently bright, shiny, and white. The humans in both are presented as props, demonstrating how the landscape is used. And both of these uses are imagined by Western illustrators, dictating the narratives of those locations. As props, the relationship between the viewer and the human subjects in each image differ. In the No Florida advertisement, the viewer is meant to identify with the resort guests. In the Bates print, the human subjects are depicted as anthropological specimens from a time long ago in a place far away, demonstrating the myth of European and American superiority. No Florida portrays the future of Bates' colonial dreams, and that landscape fantasy continues to reinforce its survival as it's subsequently repeated in one backyard after another. Through the nature of its pleasurable aesthetics, the simulation shows no signs of stopping. It replicates itself most perfectly in residential landscapes. The aesthetic and vegetative myth is consumed and reproduced over and over again. Domestic landscape architects of the region know no other version of the state. Google searches of the Madagascar Eureka, Asian fishtail, or Chinese fan palm all offer Florida plant guides. In this image from a promotion of for a South Florida landscape architect, Australian foxtail and Chinese fan palms line the garden's edge. Bright red Hawaiian Thai plants grow on top of a South American salome, and the bushy Brazilian xanadu fills out all of the undergrowth. All of these surround the perfectly manicured lawn of English descent. Surrounded by the immersive presence of the thick tropical vegetation, the lawn becomes the site of Western domestication of the tropics. 
and a safe reprieve from the visual stimulation and implied danger of the dark crevices and thick brush of the jungle. The backyard reproduces the formula produced by the Miami Biltmore Hotel perfectly. The yard comes at the end of a lineage of colonialist landscape production, whether in representation or reproduction, that is so far removed from its original context that it's hard to see the landscape's implicit power. As the convention is repeated in one backyard after another, the landscape of Henry Walter Bates' etching advances toward a reality through the quantity of its strategically composed vistas. Together, the endless sequence of the tropical backyards mirror his collection of landscapes published in the book of his travels. The pan-tropic aesthetic that was first brought to Florida by landscape architects and developers like the Biltmore's George Merrick and Frank Button spread throughout the region, creating a new tropics. South Florida has become a domesticated form and hybrid of all those disparate regions, realizing Bates' colonial dreams. Thank you.